DSP, from where you sit as the uh, director responsible for uh, National Counterterrorism Department, our brother has tried to define terrorism, but what is the uh, working definition that the Ghana Police Service also uses when it comes to the issues about terrorism? Thank you. I think uh, as a country, we, we cannot have a different definition. So we all ascribe to the 2008 act that we are using. Basically, any act that seeks to prepare an ideology, usually it can be of a social nature, religious, political, which is usually targeted at civilians, like you said. So we don't have different definitions for the Ghana Police Service, the Ghana Immigration, Ghana Armed Forces. We all go the same way. And the good thing is we don't work in isolation. We work with each other, so we all go to the same processes to define it. Indeed. So um, the, the, the DSP is emphasizing that there is a national security architecture, and all the actors in the architecture work in tandem to make sure that they can achieve, achieve the single aim. That's the understanding that I get great. All right. So uh, let me, uh, and I'll come back to you, um, uh, Mr. Police Officer, but let me go to the national security man. And normally, national security people, they don't disclose themselves. So uh, whatever he says and does, please keep it under wraps. Don't take it outside. So I've, I've issued a disclaimer for you. All right, so Daniel, uh, we are happy to have you here. You're an analyst at the National Counterterrorism Fusion Center, which means that there's a fusion center at the National Security. Tell us, what does this center do as far as your work is concerned? The center seeks to coordinate the activities of the various security agencies. Okay, so we, we are not hearing you. You may want to come a bit closer to the microphone. Yes, please. Thank you. What the center actually does is that we collaborate and coordinate the activities of the various security sectors in terms of city counterterrorism. So um, we have partners that we work with. Aside the security agencies, we have the CSOs, the NGOs, and then some uh, religious bodies as well that we work with as a center. So actually what we do more or less is... Can, can the microphone come up a bit? Yes. Okay. So actually what we do more or less is making sure that all security agencies act according to the framework that was established in 2019. Indeed. So uh, there is a national security strategy which was uh, born re in recent time. I think that was in 2019. Tell us about the national security strategy. What really is it and why has it become so important? Okay. Uh, we can see what is happening around us, especially from money like upwards, then Nigeria and recently Togo, which is very close to us. So the framework seeks to coordinate the activities of us. We don't want to work in isolation. Working together. So the framework is what is guiding us. It's a guiding um, principle that keeps us together as security agencies so that we don't keep information from each other, but then we rather synchronize all activities of CT together. So this national security strategy is not a secret document. It's a public document. It is a public document. Mm -hmm. It's not a secret document. And that everybody sitting here can actually have access to it to read it for themselves. Exactly. Where, where can they find it? Okay, we've distributed enough since 2019, and currently we still have some that we do distribute when we meet student bodies. Is there a soft copy that you can possibly get yeah, there online? Is a soft copy. No, not online, but okay. there is a soft copy. It's a soft copy. All right, so um, we, 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 we're having a conversation essentially about terrorism and uh, I have introduced my uh, three guests. We've just been joined by a fourth guest who is from the Ghana Immigration Service. Uh, someone may ask, why Ghana Immigration Service? Ghana Immigration Service plays a very important role as far as our security architecture is concerned, the security of the interior. And so we have with us Chief Superintendent Michael Amwa Atta. He is the PRO. Amwa, oh, it's Amwa Kwata, rather, I'm sorry. So Chief Superintendent Michael Amwa Kwata, he is the PRO, uh, or you are, the, are you the head of the PRO department, Ghana head Immigration Public Service? Affairs. Head Public Affairs, all right, so, so he's the head. Chief, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we are, it's good to have you. We will let you catch your breath before we come to you. All right, let me uh, go back to the police officer and to uh, move the conversation on and to say that at the police service, we have given a working definition to terrorism. What is the, 
for want of a better word, if you want to inquire, what would you say as a country? Ghana. Not, there are a lot of nationalities here. So I don't want to limit our conversation just to Ghana. But because we are here in Ghana, we will start from Ghana and we'll lift it off to other places. But to find out from you quickly and to say that as a country, what is the level of alertness or readiness we put to the issues of terrorism and the likelihood of such happenings in our country? What kind of um, alertness do we place on it? I know recently there's a launch of a program. If you see something, say something. Uh, why are we even launching that? Why should anybody even be mindful of the issues about terrorism? Oh, okay, that's, that's a good question. The alertness uh, that we usually put is not done by the Ghana Police Service alone. Uh, if you go to Burma camp, you see them tell you we are at gold, we are yellow, we are at red, we are green. It's usually done in conjunction with the National Security Service and also uh, other people who are majority stakeholders in it. That's the government itself to tell us this. But as Ghana Police Service, when we see what is happening in the Sahel region, when I talk of Sahel region, from Niger coming all the way to Burkina Faso, when we go to Togo, what we are seeing over there, we are noticing that we are not in normal times. When I say we are not in normal times, you can sleep because we are working. But we are doing extra work for you to sleep. That is what I can say. That doesn't mean that people should be scared, but we have up our antics to make sure that whatever is happening in our neighborhood doesn't get here. Okay, so in other words, what the understanding I get from your submission is that everybody in the country needs to be concerned about this issue of terrorism as has been uh, properly defined. And that is because no matter where you find yourself, it concerns you one way or the other. Yes, exactly. And so you should be mindful of it. Exactly. Okay, let me come to uh, the man from the Ghana Army. You are from Ghana the Army? Armed Forces. The Armed Forces, yes, sorry, Armed Forces, because <laughs> you're a Navy man. <laughs> All right, so I know that the Ghana Armed Forces complements, obviously, the, the work of all other security agencies, but the northern part of our country, the northern borders, are said to be the most porous, and that's because all the terrorism attacks that we are seeing and hearing about, all right, in recent time, we've seen some in Togo, which is um, on the eastern part of the country, but mostly it's been at the Burkina Faso Sahel region, and so at the border area, we know that the military is doing a lot of work to make sure that they protect the country and to uh, cut out any possible infusion of terrorism into our country. Give us a, 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 not a detailed overview, but a brief overview of what the Ghana Armed Forces does to ensure that the territorial integrity of our country is maintained from the threat of terrorism. Okay, thank you very much for the question. I think you said something getting to the end of your question. You, you use the phrase territorial integrity. That is one key function of the Ghana Armed Forces. We exist to ensure that Ghana's territorial integrity is maintained. How do we do that? We protect it from external aggression. External aggression, you can look at it in different ways. Um, in contemporary times, we don't see external aggression coming in the, in the old way, where you have form of an invasion. But for the purpose of situating the issues of terrorism and violent extremism, emanating from the Sahel region, which sits directly uh, on top of Ghana, we, will, we can easily classify what is happening, the trust of the terrorism down south as a threat to uh, territorial integrity. In this respect, it becomes one of our key roles to ensure that that threat is kept at bay. Question is, how do we do this? Series of assessments came to the fore somewhere in 2018, before we all started hearing of these issues. And the trust at that time 
was appearing to be real. And so, a proactive action was taken that was signed off by the commander in chief, which was to deploy the Ghana Armed Forces led intervention force in an operation known as Operation Conquered Fist. That Conquered Fist, my colleagues here were attest to, is supposed to present that deterrence posture against the external aggressor, which in this instance are the terrorist armed groups and violent extremist organizations who are operating within the sub-region, and in particular the Sahel region. And so that was done. Beyond that, we needed to look at plugging some of the loopholes, call it vulnerabilities that we had. Um, you rightfully mentioned the phrase porous borders. Porous borders is one vulnerability that permeates almost every country in the world. Uh, not to the extent as to what we have, but there is no single country in the world who has been able to, to what do you call it, wall off their entire their borders. Entire borders. Mm. And so issues of infiltration across borders is always there. That is what is giving rise to cross-border uh, activities, uh, criminal activities, smuggling, and all that. But then, if you have porous borders, then you need to deal with the situation. One way of dealing with it is also to send uh, your, your troops as close as possible to those areas, particularly vulnerable areas who are more prone or more vulnerable within the vulnerability of porous borders. And so we've gone on a drive um, to put up some forward operating bases, spread them across the, our northern frontiers, right from the, uh, the northeast to the northwest, where we assess initially that there were some uh, threats, potential threats mm. that could emanate. And so what we do is basically to perceive the threat, go after it, and make sure we keep it at bay, all in the bay to uh, ensure mm -hmm. territorial integrity. Okay, so, so we, we are going to lift the conversation up to the impact that terrorism has on countries where acts of terrorism have been recorded, and even countries where it hasn't been recorded. There is an impact when it comes to terrorism, and one of them, as I know, is economic impact. We'll talk about it. But I'm coming to the immigration boss because one of the important things when it comes to the issues of terrorism is the movement of people. The movement of people is extremely important. The Ghana Immigration Service is responsible for controlling, quote unquote, the movement of people in and out of the country. And so they play a very vital role in supporting the security agencies to make sure that the right persons are entering into the country and also exiting the country. And so if you go through the airport anywhere, you will have to see an immigration officer to stamp your passport, take a picture, take your fingerprint before you exit. When you are entering, you probably will go through the same process. So Chief, we need you to educate us on the role that the immigration service plays in supporting the fight against terrorism. Yeah, thank you very much. And let me sincerely apologize for coming late. That's okay. Yeah. Um, when, when, when it comes to the threat of terrorism, Definitely, we know they will have to, if they are not within the country, they will have to walk into our country through the borders. And for us, just like my brother said, uh, in, the, in the past couple of years, when intelligence proved that the threat is getting closer than we imagined, and especially uh, at the northern borders, Burkina Faso, even just last week, there's that uh, alleged uh, incursion of some Burkinabi uh, terrorists. Uh, about 700 of them have, no, 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 not, not that, that one, one. Uh, okay. That's Sapliga. And so for us, we, we have also have heightened our alertness by engaging or deploying more border patrol officers to the northern borders and also to the eastern and western. And one critical thing that we are doing to ensure, because the porousness of our borders, that we do not get miscreants or terrorists from entry, is engaging the border community residents and sensitizing them on the dangers of aiding people 
to use unapproved routes to enter the country because you wouldn't know how to profile someone that may be entering the country to an unapproved route. So we are engaging them and letting them know that there is, there is that threat of bringing in uh, an undocumented migrant or, or, or somebody trying to use the unapproved route, there's maybe for a fee. But then the, the repercussion of such person may be very enormous upon uh, our country. And it is, it is proving to work because we get information from the border communities. And also, we, we are again, yes, we wouldn't say that we are everywhere. So the borders, nobody can cross. So again, even if there's that possibility of someone crossing to an unapproved route, we know definitely they are going to use our transport system. So we are engaging uh, transport owners and drivers and Okada riders and all that to again also sensitize them that when you pick people from certain locations along border communities and from their behavior and appearance, they are not the normal Ghanaian that you see along those places. Immediately inform the security services so that we can come in and do the proper thing. So we, we are also playing our part by ensuring that our borders remain safe. And like you say, there are joint operations with the army, with police and uh, national security. Again, at the northern part where Burkina Faso has been swallowed about 80 percent of their country into rebel hands. So we are making sure that we do our best. All right. So guys, if once we are finished with the, uh, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen who are sitting here, we will come to you, the students. There are some of you who come from different countries who have your experiences about terrorism and all that. We'll come to you so that you share your experiences because it's extremely important. Some of these intelligent officers here, I'm sure we even like to hear you and to pick some thoughts out of your communication. But let's just move our conversation before we wrap up to the impact that acts of terrorism has on countries. And once we move the conversation there, we get to understand why we should do everything to prevent terrorism. You know, I was reading um, a document the other day and it said to me that there is the, the single most dangerous and most perhaps most powerful danger that the world finds itself in now is the issue of terrorism. It can bring down an entire economy. It can destroy a whole country and all that. So from the experts, and I'm, I'm asking all of you the same question. From where you sit, I'll start with you, uh, our, our police officer, that when you guys are your, in your meetings and all that, and you are talking about terrorism, assessing terrorism and all that, what are some of the things that run through your mind about the level of impact it could have on any, it has on any country, especially those who have experienced it, like our brothers from Nigeria, Burkina Faso, the kind of impact it's having those who haven't experienced it, thankfully, like Ghana, the kind of impact it will have on us if we do experience it. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at impact analysis of terrorism. Thank you. So uh, let's just start. If there is any incident of terrorism in Accra here, I don't think we'll be able to sit here and even have this conversation. Uh, you were talking about uh, some of our neighboring countries not West Africa. Now, West Africa is actually the hub in the whole world where we have major incidents of terrorism over here. Go to Nigeria, northern Nigeria, people are not able to go to school. And I'm pretty sure most of the people over here are students. So, on your level, no schooling. I know people will be happy, people will be having free time, enjoying yourself, because people don't like school, but that won't be there. There were certain times we all saw churches, people were in church praying, People came in. I don't think if you, you want to go to church where we have people coming with rifles and other AKs to come and shoot you. Economic. Anything is about money. And uh, when markets are not running, when banks are not opening, when people are not doing their businesses, everything grinds to a halt. My senior from the immigration service was talking about Burkina Faso, where about 80% of the country has been taken over by rebels and terrorists, whatever you want to put it. Nothing works. You go to Niger, a lot of things. So the daily thing that we take for granted over here, we wake up in the morning, we go pick our cars, drive to the schools, 
drive to our work will be difficult for you to do. So the impact is enormous. It can't be just one side because it moves from one side to the other side because everything is a puzzle which fits together. And once one place is let down, the whole place, yeah, okay. hospitals, churches, schools, you name it, markets and everything, even having the time to go and visit your friends, you cannot do that because when you, when you try doing that, you're going to have an issue. So the impact is enormous. And we as Ghana Police Service, we have recognized this. That is how come we are all trying to work together. So aside the ones we are doing with the other sister agencies, we also have our intel teams who are playing close, who are also outside trying to get as much information for us mm -hmm. and we share with other agencies to make sure that we are where we are. We, we hear that the police service is becoming very, very professional, particularly because of how you dealt with the recent New Patriotic Party uh, conference. You say you are becoming very professional. Should we look forward to your level of professionalism in maintaining the uh, integrity of the interior as far as uh, 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 terrorist attacks are concerned? I will not say we are becoming professional. We have always been professional. Oh, you have always been? OK, I'm yes. sorry. Okay. We have about okay. 40,000 men. So if you meet <laughs> one person or two somewhere and you use that one to tag the whole people, I don't think it will be right. We have always been professional. And one thing we can assure that the professionalism which you are testing to will be brought to bear when we um, when it comes to that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, friends. So let me come to you, uh, National Security Man, and your view when it comes to the impact that terrorism has on countries that have experienced it or likely to have on countries that may experience it. Okay. Uh, with the impact, the thing I would say is that what the terrorist seeks to achieve is to put fear in people. So once they have the chance to have the, like when there's a first attack in Ghana now, I'm sure nobody will be willing to even come to this room to sit. And then when you look at countries like Mali, now let's say it's out now. But there's terrorists everywhere. You come to Burkina and like my brother said, 80% of the land is gone. It's in the hands of terrorists. And that in part, we are also feeling it above. Our market women who go to Burkina or Tomatoes and other stuff are facing problems because when they are going, they get stopped on the road, harassed and all that. So the impact just cuts across. Everybody will, have, will feel it, especially our economy. And when the economy runs down, it's everywhere. So for the impact, it's everything. That's why we like the see something, say something, so that we will all be watching out for our brothers. And be each other's keeper. Yeah. All right, so impact of terrorism can never be compromised. All right, we will take our wrap-up words from everybody. But before then, the two of you will also share your thoughts on uh, your view when it comes to the impact that terrorism has on countries that experience them or countries that may or are likely to experience them. Impact analysis generally from your uh, point of view. So I'll start with you, uh, Commander. Okay, thank you very much. If you want to look at the impact of terrorism holistically, just picture a situation where there's no air. A picture where? Picture a situation where there is no air to breathe. Oh. Okay. That is how bad the impact can be. It affects the fabrics, all fabrics of society. There are social impacts, there are economic impacts, there are religious impacts, there are uh, uh, security impacts, a whole lot. Let's look at it in smaller bits. My colleagues have touched on some of them. When you look at socioeconomic impact, what was the first correspondence from national security that got all of us getting into this kind of mood. It was an advice to, to areas of worship for them, because it's a point for the congregation of persons to, to keep up with um, current security trends to prevent or to be able to uh, prevent any attack. And I have seen that in my church. Every Sunday, there are two police officers and two military officers. Thank every you. Sunday. Thank you. The last so, uh, two months or so. So you see yeah. the impact. Look at what happens in other areas kidnappings, priests, imams, nobody is spared. That is one impact. If you, again, you look at socioeconomic activities, nobody can, can go to their farms. The terrorists will loot your farms to be able to survive, to be able to continue carrying out their activities. Work, for instance, the gold mines. They are always interested in the gold mines. 
Why? Because they can mine the gold, get money to keep financing their activities. So the impact is all over. The impact on security. Again, there was just an Afrobarometer report that came out, and they asked in one of the polls a question about how secure you feel. It increases the perception of insecurity, even though it may not be access, because you are not sure. Today, you can walk from here after this show and then walk all the way to the junction. Once issues of terrorism come in and attacks are rampant and you have no idea where the next attack is going to happen, I bet you, you will not walk from here to the junction alone. You will always have to move in teams. Oh, or once you are walking, like you'll be watching your back. Watching your back. Mm. So the impact is all over. On even the security personnel who manage the situation, the responders, in the current situation where we have, how many deaths do we record or casualties do we record amongst all the security services in a year? Probably not up to 0.01% of their total population. Bring in terrorism and you realize that that will be a number that probably cannot be managed. Let me just give you a few statistics. From 2010 right up to 2021, in 2010, we recorded about 381 attacks in the entire Sahel region. These are attacks that were perpetrated by um, terrorist groups. How many casualties were recorded? Only 400 casualties. I'm not happy to say only, but it's just to tell you the magnitude or the enormity of the increases. At the end of 2021, what did we see? 1,990 attacks, yielding 6,843 casualties. That's huge. That's huge. By the end of the first quarter of this year, the first three months, January, February, March, we had recorded 884 attacks in the same areas with a whooping 2,440 casualties. Showing by the, end of, by the, the year, end of the year, we have... are going to exceed that. Yeah. And that should tell you that the threat is real. The trust from the Sahel coming down is real. And it's associated the issues. And, and then, oh, and can you, if you can link it to the recent coup d'etats that have happened in the yes. sub region. So I was going to go to that. Mm. There is even the issue of political uh, security. What do we see? We saw, we saw uh, the military takeover in, 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 in Burkina Faso. Before then, we saw it in Mali. What reasons were ascribed? Insecurity. Mm -hmm. We've seen four different attempts which have been fought in Niger. What reasons were ascribed? Insecurity. We saw uh, Guinea-Bissau within the sub-region who quickly requested for an ECOWAS uh, intervention mission to help stabilize the situation. Indeed, ECOWAS has responded and deployed. We saw the issues. I mean, it, 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 it cuts across. Yeah. Togo, what did Togo do? Togo has declared a state of emergency within the Savans regions in the north, the northern part of the country, all in a bid to respond. So the impacts are, are huge. Cost to life and property, cost the country a lot of money because then now what will happen? You need to invest more in your security forces. You need to buy more equipment. You need to be able to replace them. Yeah, and is that happening in Ghana? Is that happening are, in Ghana? We are now? not there. That is okay. why we have been proactive. Mm. That is I'm why talking about the investments. The investments. Yes. Obviously, if you have a plan or a strategy to be able to prosecute that strategy, it comes with certain expenditure for you to be able to achieve the needed results that you want. And you can see. That has resulted in retooling of, say, the security services. Okay, so you're going to have the last word. I'm coming to you, um, Chief. As you also tell us about what you perceive as the impact, you will give us your wrapping up words, as in looking at the faces of all these beautiful uh, future leaders sitting here. What would you tell them as your last words uh, by way of the concept of terrorism and what they need to be aware of, what they need to do uh, to help in the fight against terrorism. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I wouldn't deliver the point on the mm. impact. I want yeah. to look at the impact in another way. He okay. made mention of it in his later submission, and that is, uh, I'll give an example. I was in uh, Kenya after the attack, and one thing I realized or I saw was that they have heightened their security alertness in every sphere of the economy. So I can leave my hotel four times, and 
of all the four types, I'll go to thorough checks. They don't take anything for granted mm -hmm. at the airport, whatever. So that is an impact, although positive. Mm -hmm. Then even in Ghana, I think last year or thereabout, we were asked by government to submit, and I think it goes also for the other institutions, a four-year logistical plan in progression towards the tracks. And out of that, it has led to a lot of retooling in the Ghana military service. We've increased our personnel levels and also deployed more uh, border party officers to the borders. And in terms of arms and other logistical needs, government has provided. If it is just the threat of it coming, and I think it has some positive sides that will help or inure to the benefit of uh, uh, the people of Ghana. I will want to conclude on this. So, so is it a case of uh, when you see that your neighbor's beard is burning, uh, exactly. then you, you make sure that you... You, 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 you get a, a bucket of water uh, by, yeah, your side. by your side. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, I would like to conclude on this, that for us from the Ghana Immigration Service, uh, the security is a large area, but we all contribute our part to ensure that the national goal is achieved. And one thing that we always hammer on is the part that the other Ghanaian should play in relation to some of our laws and regulations pertaining to immigration. So then, for example, we want to appeal to land laws and property owners. Because if, if, if uh, any miscrant enters the country, you need accommodation, and you are a landlord or a property owner, then maybe you come to rent a place. So we are saying that if you meet such a person, a non ghanaian you demand for his passport or immigration status. If you are not sure, then refer the person to immigration or escort the person to the nearest immigration office or to the police station. Otherwise, if your apartment is used to engage in anything that is a threat to the security of the country, if you are convicted at least some few years, you will enjoy in the prisons. <laughs> Same goes to hoteliers. Every Friday, they have to submit returns on all lodges in their facilities because we, we, we share common databases about suspects and people that should not enter the country. So when we get such information, we are able to analyze and get out those that we do not want to see them in Ghana or people of interest that we want to trail and see what uh, they are here for. So I will appeal to every Ghanaian here and especially students that in your communities, in your lecture halls, in your hostels and all that, definitely you see things that are not normal. Somebody engaging in, in, in a, a, a site on the internet that has certain posts that you think uh, to violence and all these things. Like we say, don't just see it, but say something. Mm -hmm. Because it becomes radicalized and it leads to some uh, uh, blasting of your hostel or your lecture hall, you'll be part. Mm -hmm. So let us all be alert and sensitive to issues around us and report to the security services for the proper interventions to be made. That's a very in interesting revelation that he just made there. Uh, if you go to a hotel and you are asked to provide your passport, don't think it's for fun. <laughs> it's not for fun. <laughs> all right. So, Chief, your wrap-up was for all these beautiful souls looking at you. Okay. Uh, what I would like to say is that the threat of terrorism is very real. And that uh, we shouldn't panic. The security agencies, like they've all said, they are on the field and they are doing everything possible to protect us. But as students and Ghanaians, we should also be looking out for some elements. Like my brother just said, when you have a tenant or even your roommate, when you suspect something, say something. Just call so you mean the students here and their roommates? Exactly. Okay. I hear there are about 40 different nationalities here today. 40 of them. Well, a radicalized <laughs> mind cannot be seen when the person is working. So when you suspect something, you know, but is it your friend, your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, say something. Report to authorities or the police, or you can call 999 and then you will respond. Absolutely. So, Chief, your last words. I'm, I'm just going to add up to whatever is being said over here. There is one misconception that we all have which we have to throw it out. A terrorist is not the person who is wearing a hijab or wearing a long dress or is a Muslim. Or say Allah Wakuba. That is not a terrorist. Okay. We shouldn't mistake somebody who is practicing his religion to be a terrorist. Most terrorists 
are extremists, but not all extremists are terrorists. As students, we should know that even in Ghana here, we've had people from our university, Kwame Kuma University, who have been identified as being part of ISIS and other stuff. I'm pretty sure every student over here has read about it. So when we are telling you to, when you see something, say something, it doesn't mean that uh, when you have a friend who is chasing your girlfriend, you can come and, and call us. Because they will tell you, the 999 numbers that we gave up within 24 hours. I hear a lot of prank calls. Prank calls. Yeah. Those are not the ones you're talking about. When you have a friend who has all of a sudden changed in his behavior, you will know the person well. Some of us like to play a different side, the dark web and all those things. Those are the ones we are talking about. You will all of a sudden see a, a change. Be it sometimes it might be subtle, but sometimes it might be so visible that you need to inform. You don't have to always report even to the police. In a school environment like this, you have people in authority that you can talk to. They will in turn send some message to us. But if you feel that the person that you are supposed to talk to is the person who is actually indoctrinating people, then you can always get back to us. The police, we are always happy to hear from you. You can call the 1-8555 or you call the 999. The National Security will take it and refer back to us. One thing you should be assured is all of us over here are doing everything in our power to keep the country safe, to make sure that you sleep and go and visit your girlfriend at night. Thank you. Commander Philip has the last word. Okay, thank you. Um, with the audience being students, I would like to use a few minutes to bring your mind to what the national response plan is and what role you have to play in there. Our national response plan to deal with the threat of terrorism and violent extremism is based on our anti-terrorism law, which I first alluded to, and then also a national framework for countering terrorism and violent extremism. Like you requested, we can make these documents in soft copies available for your... I think they should the be available in all universities. For them to, Every university student should have a copy. To appraise themselves of the yeah. detailed content. But just to give you a summary, this strategy is hinged on three legs. The first leg is what we want to call the political and diplomatic approaches. These approaches deal with a legal framework that is needed to be able to confront the threat. That has already been done. We have our national security strategy. We have our national defense strategy. We have our, um, how do you call it? We have our foreign policy. We have, our counter, uh, we have the framework for, for dealing with terrorism and counterterrorism and violent extremism. We have our national migration policy. We have the Cyber Security Act. We have all of this in totality to be able to deal with these kind of threats. Don't forget that all this is needed because terrorism financing is also a crime and it's also, and it's also a catalyst to increasing terrorist activity. So if you hear things like um, finance, financial regulations, you hear things like, um, what do you call it? Um, you hear things like uh, Cyber Security Act and all that. Like you said, they will print radicalization, recruitment. Most of it is done through our uh, cyberspace. And so this is important. The other approach is what we want to call the kinetic approach. The kinetic approach broadly deals with issues of intelligence and operations. So our approach is intelligence-led operations. And that is why we have the, the National Counterterrorism Fusion Center, where all intelligence-related material converges for proper assessment to drive the operational aspects. Within the operations, I've brought your mind to the fact that we are having what we call the operations uh, conquered, conquered phase, which has been running for a few years now. To the extent that it is achieving its strategic objectives and its end state, we will say things are going well. But then the last approach, which is Building national cohesion and country resilience is where we all have a role to play. Question is, what role do we have to play as students and as citizens or as legal residents in Ghana, you have a role to play. It is important that our actions 
together help us to build the needed resilience against the threat. How do we build this resilience? My colleagues on this panel have brought up some of the issues. Uh, see something, say something. Um, issues like understanding educational activities like this. Uh, issues like uh, playing your role in terms, of, uh, in terms of reporting what is not good. Playing your role in terms of even understanding the times in which we are and what actions you need to take. Playing your role in terms of contributing to the collective security of everybody. This is from doing bad things, learn what is right, and do what is right, as is required of a citizen. And then the other aspect, which has to do with the building national cohesion, will all fall in place if we are all thinking alike. Hence, the mantras, see something, say something. Okay. Hence, the mantras, uh, send, sending development to the people. Decentralization is how we feel we want to do it. Devolution of uh, development is how we want to go. It's in progress. Let's support it. Our own political atmosphere, what is it? It should be driven by issues and not of the other things that we know that are not good, that I don't want to go into. So all in all, this is a three-pronged approach that country Ghana is using to manage the situation and has in place measures within it to confront the situation head on. Before you leave, just take this away. All this is done so that you can go about your business freely. All this is done so that you can go about your business freely. So just to sum up the strategy, it is what we call the three Ps and one R. What are the three Ps? First, we want to prevent any attack. All the things we want to do to build national cohesion, to increase our country resilience and all of that is geared towards making us prevent any infiltration and possible attack. All that we do is to we want, to, we want to be able to stay within that prevent phase. Call it the green light on your traffic light. And then the other P is what? Preempt. And then the other P is, 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 is prevent, prevent, preempt, protect, 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 and respond. The other two Ps, preempt and protect, call it the amber light within your traffic light system. That is left for the security agencies and other stakeholders to deal with. The National House of Chiefs are our stakeholders. Media, you are stakeholders. Events like this give us the opportunity to speak to a greater number of people. All this is done so that we remain within the green zone, which is the prevent. But should anything happen and an attack is recorded, we move into the red light, which is the respond. That is the R. During the response phase, you equally have roles to play. We are very quick to record incidents, and then I want to be the first person to break the news. Live, uh, Facebook Live, <laughs> uh, Instagram Live, whatever, whatever Live, TikTok Live, and then we are showing it. People are dying. You look at what happened during the Apiate unfortunate yes. uh, incident. incident. The one whose video actually came out, the, 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 the back blast of the explosion threw him off. You remember his camera fell? Yes. So we shouldn't just be quick to do that. Normally, in a complex attack, when terrorists conduct that, they wait. The first incident will just be to get people together, to get people en masse, so that they can now initiate a real attack. And so you are recording, you are beaming, like everybody wants to have a look. We are all congregating. You are only moving into a bigger danger. And so these are the things are that the, I would like to okay. leave with you. Remember the traffic lights. Green is what? Prevent. Everything we do is to stay in that prevent phase. As citizens who have certain rights and who have certain responsibilities to the state and to one another, then we want to allow our security agencies to continue to do what they need to do by preempting and by, prevent and by pre um, preempting and protecting so that if you see, for instance, two policemen and two soldiers at your church premise, it's all in a bit to protect. Yes. And then if an unfortunate attack is recorded, the respond phase, you know what roles to play. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's Commander Philip Odoina. He's the Acting Director, Strategic Intelligence Department of the Defense Intelligence Ghana Armed Forces. We also had DSP Daniel Deborah Silas. He is the Director, National, uh, National um, is it Center? Director National Counterterrorism. Department. Oh, Counterterrorism Department, Ghana Police Service. Thank you very much. And then Daniel Obeng Boache, analyst at the National Counterterrorism Fusion Center, National Security. And last but not the least, Chief Superintendent Michael Amwakwata, PRO of the Ghana Immigration Service. Please put your hands together for these gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your rich conversation. And what I can assure you is that. I have an assistant here. She's called Clangson. Clangson, a champion. Clangson is going to get your numbers. This conversation is going to go onto radio on Asazi Radio 99.7, 99.5 megahertz in Accra. So Clangson will come and get the details and we will take it to the radio because the conversation is rich. It cannot end here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right, so we take a picture, right? Okay. Great, so let's take a picture quickly. Hello, and then I'm we will Spencer. move on to the Spencer Kobna Boati Mensa. And you're welcome to our beautifully diversified city of academics and experiential studies, ACT. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about mass communication and how it is relevant in our everyday life. When you watch television or movies, listen to radio or music read newspapers, books, journals, or see an advert or photos in magazines, say thanks to mass communication. Because the processes of creating and disseminating information are due to the study of mass communication. Your communications career begins here in the Department of Communications Arts at Academic City University College, Accra, Ghana. Here, we engage the best industry professionals to train future-ready communicators for companies home and abroad. By the end of each class, our students get a step ready to enter the increasingly dynamic communications industry. And I'll tell you how. The communications law and ethics course at the department, for example, provides students substantial skills to identify and resolve legal and ethical issues with rules from across various fields of communication. If you want to teach others how to knot a tie, you knot with them. That is why here, our students produce, direct, edit, report, and take part in experiential processes at the ACT Productions. ACT Productions? Yes. The ACT Radio and TV, for example, is resourced by professionals with enormous experiences in communications arts. During your time with us, you will learn from professionals who render substantial skills required for communication career of your choice, whether in journalism, entertainment, public relations, law, marketing, advertising, etc. Wherever you are, I will be right here waiting for you at ACT. I am yours ever, Spencer KBM. My name is Andrew Latechi. I studied mechanical engineering and I will describe my journey at Academic City as events. So. My journey so far as a woman in engineering hasn't been very challenging but wonderful and um, a learning process. Because I, with the help of my colleagues and lecturers, I have been able to learn a lot and also take initiatives. Because when we came to the school in the beginning, the workshop wasn't really done, things weren't really put in place and all that. So because of that, I had to take some initiatives, for example, learning the CNC machine, learning 3D printing, introducing more 3D printers into the school, organizing classes to help people understand these machines, help me learn more skills because the more you teach people the more you learn from them you have to constantly go update your skills to be able to impact and teach people so basically that has been my journey it has been growth and um, a learning experience for me. my two outstanding projects i worked on is the electric future and then the electric bike 
This was because I was able to work with my colleagues to bring uh, something into, to innovate something and hopefully make, start a company out of that that is going to help the manufacturing sector oh. in Africa. Uh, all right. Uh, one day, every day will be Friday, you know. We go just to celebrate, oh, like saying I am you know. My baby, one day, on a church, you know. Cruising as we vibrate, oh, that day, not today, you know. Big things are happening now. More this, more that, more babes, so oh, more cash. More babes, so oh, more cash. Big things are happening now. More this, more that, more babes, so oh, more cash. More, uh, let's go. Let it shine like, oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, who be that to? Yeah, 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 give me that to. Thank you guys for listening to my song. I appreciate you guys. Okay, so that was um, Chinazo. Yes. You overgot it this time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I do is I like Nigerian names. Oh. So right. I like uh, such names. So Chinazo, yes, thank you for your song. And um, I think that we should go on straight to our conversation. And you guys were supposed to make preliminary statements and observations. I'm told that some of you have experiences when it comes to the issue about terrorism yeah. and all that from where you're coming from. Yeah. So I will first establish your uh, initial thoughts as quickly as you can. And then we can have the conversation expanded, and then we'll bring our friends into the conversation. Sure. So uh, you will introduce yourself again, even though I've introduced you. You mention your name, and then you make your preliminary comments. Okay. Good day, everyone, once again. My name is Chinazo Vince Okorie, popularly known as Vince. You see, the issue of uh, I'm Nigerian, let me state that, it's very important. So the issue of the word terrorism, um, my initial thoughts on it is it's cloaked in uh, or is guised in something, another word, rebellion. You see, the problem with it or the uh, issue with it is most people can, it can be guised like a Robin Hood effect or a Robin Hood action. Um, okay, let's take for example, these people, they are rich, they have money, they are taking all the money in, in the government, let's go and fight for our money. See, from the point of someone saying that, they are doing what is right. They are doing what they believe to be cool or a must, or they're fighting for their lives. But for others, they might not see the big picture, but they are actually, actually terrorizing their nation. So um, I, have a, I have a few experiences with that, but I should say my preliminary thoughts on it. I think it's a word that, as you said, or as was previously said, it keeps evolving. Its definition keeps evolving because there are different ways it, where it displays itself. So I'm really, really happy to be here. To Which part of Nigeria do you come from? Imo State. Imo, uh, so Imo is where? North, middle, no, the south? East, the east, the east. So southeast? No, the east. It's the east. It's just east? Yes, like the east, eastern part. Oh, so when we take something like Ghana, uh, we have the... You can say that Volta region is in the eastern part of the country, and then northeastern region is also in the eastern part of the country, but yeah. northeastern is in the northern part. Yeah. So when you say, uh, you know the Nigerian map, yeah. uh, when you look at it, where would you say? Would it be southeast or northeast or middle east? <laughs> Not the middle east. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's mostly referred to us on the eastern, in the eastern, eastern side of, okay. of, of Nigeria. So we take Nigeria, the eastern part will be the part closer to Cameroon. Um, not, you see, you have to look at it based on uh, the longitude and latitude of the whole world mm. to know what part of it is. But central Nigeria is Abuja. And looking at from that point downwards, that's where the eastern part is, it's close to the coast. So yeah, it's around that. Area. Okay. It, I ask because of the uh, geographical dynamics when it comes to uh, terrorism in Nigeria. Yeah. All right, let me come to you, sir. Uh, you introduce yourself again and then your initial comments. Good evening. Um, my name is Abba Ali Ubako. Um, I am from the northern part of Nigeria, if I may. Um, I'm from the northwestern part of Nigeria. Nigeria so, okay. 
my initial thoughts about theorism is that it's, I wouldn't say it has evolved or the name has evolved in certain ways because I have a favorite definition that says terrorism is when people act or force upon people ideologies or cause harm to them with the use of violence. The word violence always comes into every single definition. Even when the experts were talking, you could hear the word violence coming back and forth. So for, uh, for an American today, if you mention the number 9-11, the first thing that comes to their mind is a terrorist attack in, during 9-11. So that comes for a Nigerian, if you mention maybe a date around 2011, when the first bombing happened in Nigeria, that's where our minds will obviously go to. So from there, you start hearing the change in the name. You start hearing things like bandits, unknown gunmen, Fulani herdsmen. So these kind of things come up a lot in Nigeria, you say. But for me, I've classified them, they're all terrorists. Today, again, in foreign countries or in the Western world, a terrorist for them is someone that has a turban and has a gun and is shooting people and shouting Allah Akbar. If a person from that country should do it, it won't be classified as a terrorist. They'll tell you the person is mentally ill. If somebody else of a different race should speak about these kind of things, again, they'll be deemed as terrorists. So the dynamic is not really evolving, but the dynamic is the country is looked at and how it's looked at from various perspectives. So from an international relations standpoint, again, that's the process. That's right. Okay, great. So let me come. So these are our two Nigerian friends. I want to believe that these are our two Ghanaian friends. Okay, so let me come to our two Ghanaian friends. And I should have done ladies first. I failed, but don't worry. I'm, 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 I'm repairing that damage. So let me come to you, my sister. Introduce yourself and then your initial comments. Hi, my name is Martina from the Ghana Institute of Journalism. So um, right now I feel quite attacked because I'm the only one who has my paper, <laughs> so sorry. So with examples like Boko Haram, ISIS and Osama bin Laden, terrorism has impacts like um, post-traumatic disorders for our physical and it undermines peace and security. It divides communities, exacerbates conflict and destabilizes entire regions. It hampers our efforts to promote and protect human rights and is an obstacle to sustainable development for every country in the world. Like at unprecedented levels, it affects us even today. Terrorists are exploiting social media to recruit new followers amongst us, the youth, students, young people, to help them coordinate attacks. So to me, the students are the, the let me call the vulnerable or the marginalized today. And we have a typical example in 2015 when a Ghanaian who was a geographical student, I don't know if anyone had heard that story, but his name was Mohammed Nazir Norte. That is a guy. He was recruited by ISIS through online forums. And recent intelligence shows that Ghanaians are being uh, forced or coerced to join extremist groups now. So tonight, my presence here is just for two things. First, to urge fellow Ghanaians and students to be observant of our surroundings, stay safe, and report suspicious occurrences or people. See something, say something, and not see something, take something. Because yes, most of these attacks are directed to our government or decision-making bodies to change status quo, but we, the civilians, are the ones that get hurt in the processes. Thank you. Okay, so that's a lot of information coming from our sister. We should have started, we should have done the ladies first. You know. Anyway, yes, gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> hello. Uh, so my name is Paco Isia Champon, but I prefer you call me by my initial speaking. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm from Central University, and I'm glad to be part of this uh, conversation here today. All right, my initial comment. I want us to, first of all, pay attention to the word terrorism. When we look at it like that, from the layman perception, we, we normally misconcept it. We look at uh, other forms of crimes and other forms of violence as terrorism. So uh, right here today, I want to join us so that we, we take the misconception out of what we know is terrorism and see uh, how we students can contribute to it. So yeah, that's about it for me. Okay, okay, great. So uh, the, the interesting comments are the, at the beginning, but this conversation is not going to go on for too long because it's something that is going to continue even after here. But the two of you are coming from a country where terrorism, uh, I would not say has a grip, but has been 
evident. Tell us your personal experiences, if any, as far as uh, terrorism is concerned. I'll start with you, uh, Abba. Um, so, from personal experience, the state I come from is Sokoto State. Um, I remember actually when two bombs went off simultaneously in the state. Um, they went off in two police stations, one a headquarter and one a, divisional, um, a regional division. Um, there was so much panic around the state at the time because people didn't understand what was going on. Things that you see in movies are happening right next to you. I mean, a local person wouldn't, some of them don't even watch movies that much, but you, today you wake up and there's an explosion. People are actually dying. So all the film tricks are happening in real life. So there's a whole confusion. Now, this isn't where it hurts. It's when you're of this religion or you're of this thing, then you're in the country and then somebody tells you, oh, you're from here. Are you a Boko Haram member? Are you a terrorist? Are you this? <laughs> so mind you, this just doesn't happen again in the country. Immediately you leave the country. Imagine being on the subway and you're wearing a kaftan around that time. People walk away from you, and this is personal experience. So we have seen the dynamic of the North being casted into, okay, yeah, you guys are this, you guys are that. And mostly because people are being recruited, like our colleague here said, people are being recruited mostly because there isn't proper education for them or Again, like our experts say, there are coerced borders. People just come in anyhow. There's an informal educational system there as well. So they twist the wording of the Holy Quran. They twist it into encouraging these people into joining Boko Haram. So you see these kind of things happen. And it's very devastating to see, but it's the reality of the world today. Mm. All right. So, uh, Shiriz, any uh, comments? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a short movie that was my life at some point. So I lived in Abuja. Um, it's, uh, the northerners are around there, OK? So you can say the northern tribe is dominating that portion of I've land. been to Abuja, Abuja a couple of times, fantastic. so I can understand the oh, concept. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So a Tuesday morning, I remember it's Tuesday, because it's funny how you remember the details when something happens. A Tuesday morning, my mom sent me to go and buy Owosu. If any of you know what owo soup is. What is owo soup? Owo, owo, owo soup. soup. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a, a local dialect. It means money soup. You need money to make that kind of soup. There's a lot of fundamentals inside. Uh -huh. She sent me to go and buy owo soup. I booked an Uber at the time. It was about 20 Ghana cities equivalent to go there. And I did. And when reaching there, I told the person, Patro, Mami, Gobe, I said, Gobe, oh, wait, two cities, why? I mean, that's the Ghana mm. dialect equivalent. So when I reached there, she gave me the Uwusu and I booked my Uber back. It was even more, there was like 23 cities now going back. When I reached going close to my house, there was traffic. So imagine traffic on this ACT road. It doesn't make any sense. Why is there traffic? I was wondering. And then I started to hear the noise. You guys were making noise, but I didn't know what it was. I thought they were having a party. If you know Nigerians, we don't play with parties. So I said, okay. Then about four cars away, I start to hear that the noise becomes less of an enjoyment noise and more of a, a Pain. fear noise. Mm. So I'm, 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 I'm confused. It becomes three cars away from me. Then I start to hear the noise that I'm, I'm not confused anymore that it's fear noise and it's not enjoyment. I can see my Uber driver has removed hand from his steering and his hand is close to the seat belt. Sharp guy, I've removed my seatbelt already. My hand is on the door. You get me? So now it's now two cars away from me, and I can hear that they are speaking Hausa. But I don't understand Hausa. So I've already started preparing what I will say. So when you climb uh, Okada in uh, that place, and you don't understand Hausa, you say Baosa. Baosa means I don't understand Hausa. So they came to my car. These guys were with machetes. Like, they look like me. Let me know. And they look like me. Let me know if you say anything. So there were machetes and they are around me. They crowd my car. And then immediately they start to hit my driver's window. Kaukudi, kaukudi, kaukudi. Kaukudi means the money? thank Bring the you. Bow, sir. I know they get, I, I know they bow. I don't understand. So they keep asking and they keep asking until one of them takes a machete and then hits the windscreen. Luckily, you know the windscreen is built in such a manner that glass doesn't just shard in. It just damages the windscreen. 
I don't know till this day why they left, but they eventually did. And I was able to go home. I asked my mom. I told her what happened. She had had similar experience because she's lived in Abuja for over 20 years. And then she told me it's a political time. And during that political time, politicians, quote unquote, gathered these um, illiterate boys, promised them like 10 cities. To them, 10 cities is like a cow. So promised them that much to go and do things like that in order to maybe dissuade them for voting for one or, or, this, or persuade them to voting for another using fear as the coercion tool. So one reason why I'm sitting here today is because I don't want to send my child to go and buy Gobe and he won't come back home because of something I could have stopped. So that's just my mm. take on Okay, so interesting um, examples. And, you know, a security expert once told me that you shouldn't walk 100 meters without looking behind you. Most of the time, we walk or we are doing things, we are going to places, and we don't care what is happening behind us. One day, I walked from, and you are from GIJ, so from the Ghana Immigration Service, there's a bus stop there. I got off in a car. That was when I was in school. By the way, I also attended Ghana Institute of Journalism. Oh. So I, I was in school. I got out of a car, and there was a lady, a classmate of mine. She also got on from a car earlier. So she had already crossed the road, gone past the road that leads from the immigration to the Canadian High Commission, and was going to GIJ. I followed her. I didn't mention anything. I followed her. She never looked behind her from the roadside all the way to campus. So I got to campus and I told her that if I were a bad person and I was going to attack you, I'd have attacked you because you didn't bother to look behind you to see what is happening. Yeah. So the security expert says that everybody must look behind you whenever you're working. I'm saying this because of this issue about terrorism. It's more about that see something, say something. It's really about look behind you yeah. and make sure that uh, there's nothing bad happening behind you. All right, so let me come to you, my Ghanaian friends, and to ask you, we haven't experienced terrorism in Ghana. Hopefully, you have. Yeah, I have an experience. You have an experience, not in Ghana. <laughs> yes, uh, tell us your experience, yes. So um, I attended a conference in Kigali, Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, a year ago or two. And I don't know if you've heard of their genocide story. Yeah. And this is post-genocide. Everywhere you go in that country, there is um, detectors for um, ammunition, any gadgets, e everywhere you go, restaurants, what's up, um, airport, everywhere. Why am I saying this? So the genocide is over. Um, the terrorism part is over to maybe the government or to the rest of the world. But to the people, mentally, it's not over. Because then you are living every day in fear or in remembrance of the reason why these detectors and okay. these... Um, uh, for lack of a better word, machinisms are still there. I don't know if you understand. So yeah. it's like it's still there even though it's gone. So sometimes these things end, but they don't end in our hearts. And um, that's the PTSD and uh, depression and etc. So I know maybe Rwandans will have some part of, uh, you know, their hearts that they cannot let go forever. And to me, it's also terrorism in my heart then because I cannot live like that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So yes, the, the obvious impact of the acts that happen and its repercussions. Okay, so let me come to you, uh, my Ghanaian friend. When you hear of all these terrorist attacks and everything that are going on, what are the immediate things that come to your mind? Do you envisage uh, those things happening in Ghana and what you would do should they happen in Ghana? So when terrorism, me hearing about terrorism in Africa was from Nigeria, when, bring back our girls. So when we hear of it on social media, it was just like, join the hashtag to get more retweets and stuff like that. So it wasn't really something like I felt like that. Then until you start seeing that more girls are getting take, uh, picked up and the rest. And, uh, into, fast forward, you see that there was one where, I saw one YouTube video where one guy was happy, like his family. They've come back. There was whatever way the girls are coming back. He's going to meet to get his sister or whatever, his family member back. Then there is violence that then the guy is dead. That one is like live to me, like I'm seeing it just that evening. I felt empathy for that. 
that's Nigeria. Recently, fast forward, we hear incidents like this happen in Togo. And I mean, Central University is not really far like that. And I'm like, hey, it's close <laughs> to me now. I'm worried. Yeah. All around us, all our neighbors, they've had uh, various forms of attacks. And it's like, hey, it's moving from the top part of Africa, coming down to the down part. And we are always screaming that Ghana is hospitable. Why are they also going to run to, to the hospitable place? And these terrorists, they attack in such a way that if you are disturbing their actions, they eliminate you. The, the, the people are going to come to Ghana. How safe are we in here? How, how do we know if they will not follow them into Ghana? Exactly. Okay. So that brings another conversation. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that we had our experts here to show us how, despite so many surveys we've had recently and the, the, the levels as the insecurity or whatever at our borders and we are scared how, whether they are coming or not. Mm. They've showed us that at least we are safe here to some mm. extent okay. and measures are being put in place. Okay, so we'll end our conversation with um, a connection of social media to terrorism. Yes. And the reason is because all of us here love social media. I want to believe that all of us here are on one social media platform or the other. Instagram people, okay, <laughs> Facebook people, all right, and the Twitter. I know as for Twitter, everybody is at Twitter. Okay, but you know, in recent time, some terrorist attacks, quote unquote, terrorist attacks, because they result in the killing of people. So in New Zealand, there was one where a, the one guy attacked, I believe, it was a church, and he had a camera connected to his gadget, and. Whilst he was shooting people, he was showing it live on Facebook. That was in New Zealand. There was another one recently in the US. And recently, I, I had the opportunity to attend a training at Fordham Law School about a month ago. And my host took me to a shop, like a shopping mall. Um, you know, the guy who killed people in um, Albany, in New York. He went to a shopping mall, and guess what? I'm in New York, and I'm in New York upstate, and my, my guest is taking me to shopping mall. a shopping mall. All of a sudden, I start feeling and thinking about that incident, because that incident, the guy was shooting people anyway. and was also showing it live on Facebook. Yeah. So the reason why I'm bringing this conversation is because we are all social media lovers. But from you, my panel, Connecting social media to the acts of terrorism, looking at the way we are using, misusing, and abusing social media now. When you see some things on social media, people putting out all their details. I was here, I was there, I did this, this, I did that, I was this, this is my friend, this is my phone number, this is my girlfriend, this is my boyfriend, all those things. How do you feel connecting them to the possibilities of people knowing your details and possibly planning attacks against you. The terrorist attack is not just when people take guns and shoot mass people. Someone can terrorize an individual because in the UK we've seen loan attacks, wolf attacks, where somebody is not happy with somebody. Like recently in Japan, a gentleman is not happy with the former prime minister. He thinks the former prime minister is connected to a certain, um, a certain um, a, a group. And because of that, he picks uh, a locally manufactured gun and shoots the prime minister, the former prime minister, and the former prime minister dies. That is Shinzo Abe, if you heard recently, the former Japanese prime minister. So I'm just looking. Social media connection to all these things we are talking about, which essentially has to do with human security. Yeah. Your comments about them quickly as we wrap up. I'll come to everyone. So I'll start from you, yes. All right. So I see social media as a tool or like a gun, all right? In the hands of the commander here, everybody that came here, everybody will feel happy, everybody will feel safe that he's the commander, he will protect us. And then in the, in the hands of someone else who is not well trained or who, is, who has an agenda, we feel scared or we feel like they are going to do something that is actually gonna hurt us. So social media is that, a tool used for good or bad. We now have to take it upon ourselves as students to use it for good. We now have to take it upon ourselves as students to see something so that we can say something as to what's happening. I'll even, 
advise us, okay, right now, who has their phone with them? Okay, thank you. So with your phone, right now, on uh, maybe what your WhatsApp status or Twitter, can you type with me together, no to terrorism, hashtag SSSS. See something, say something. And let's get this hashtag going so that we can start at our fight for terrorism right now, not tomorrow. So that's my so, take okay, on that. Chief, um, for me, I believe social media is, like Nonso said, Nazo said, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, is a tool that can do both good and harm. Um, there is such a thing as a WhatsApp university where every news that just goes there is believed by a lot of the population, particularly in Africa. Once it comes as a broadcast message, people eat it up. Oh, you can get a job here by doing this, this, and that. This is how people get recruited. This is how fake news is sent into the public. This is how yellow journalism happens as well. You exaggerate things and it helps with you. It helps these terrorist societies or organizations cause panic in the society. So I believe that, like he has said again, we need to use social media for the good and promote the hashtags, the awarenesses and everything. Also look at teaching people how to detect fake news. So media literacy is something that should also go forward because they, I'm very sure that there are people in the villages that all they have is the yam phones, the little Nokias and the little technos. They wouldn't know how to use social media like that. So we have to go a step further into having awareness campaigns such as these to go into spaces like this and talk about how terrorism can affect societies and students and everybody in general. Okay, great. So let's wrap up with you. Uh, we'll, get, we'll come to you and then we'll give the lady the last word. Ah, finally, I get to speak before they say. <laughs> All right, so um, I want us to look at uh, terrorism as a constructed reality. So look at it as uh, theatrics. So like the, uh, our experts said before, you see that uh, the, the, the plan, the first attack, is to get you to come together, then they do the second one. It's all for attention. Social media is now their tool to disseminate these their actions. Most of the time, it's to get a reaction from someone, the government. Maybe they try other routes to solve a problem. They are not getting the attention they want. When they bomb a mall, media, the, the mainstream media picks up on it. But then until then, social media is their, their, uh, their platform where they use. That's one part I wanted us to look at it from. But then again, you can see that social media now is like the warehouse where they sit and recruit people. So uh, human, uh, like we human beings here, we want to belong to something. All of us here have our own mentality. People will be there and be against it. Definitely we are going to have people who will be for the motion. Internet is connecting them together. So you see someone is in Ghana in some one corner and he will connect to it, ISIS in, wherever, and they pay for his flights to come and he joins. So they are, they are using the internet as that. So if maybe we can uh, have a conversation with authorities, where right now, we know they monitor if you put nudity on the net. So these forms of uh, recruitment, our intelligence must pick up on it so that uh, 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 they can fight it. Aside the fact that we students must join the active fight, like uh, he suggested, they see something, say something, campaign okay so you have the last word and when you are finished i'll ask a general question and see if we will have an answer to that question so madam okay. so um like you said social media at this point cannot be scrapped off totally so we should rather look for positive ways that we can make the youth make use of the social media like i'm using myself as, as an example growing up i believed isis was like cia because that's what we see in the movies. So now that I'm old, I know ISIS is not CIA or anything of that sort. So maybe there's a younger version of me that's thinking the same or worse. So we need the um, computer literacy, um, internet literacy, so the youth know what is actually going on 
and not all just the Instagram poses and all of that, because we leave digital footprints wherever we go and whatever we do. Like our moderator said, so this ISIS recruiters, they know that, okay, this is Ama or this is Kofi. Kofi doesn't have money. Kofi is feeling lonely. Kofi needs to feel a, a sense of belonging to something. They said, because they have the AI, the artificial intelligence that is running. So they know who you are, not like they know who you are, who you are, but through your digital footprints, they know who you are. They know which part of you to appeal to. So they get to you without even you realizing it. So we should limit our digital footprint as much as possible, and we should teach our friends, our colleagues, even sometimes your mom and your aunties, they don't know what is going on. Sometimes you not being a part of, I'm not part of Boko Haram, but you are sharing something. You don't even know that it contains information that they hear. Oh, Coke is giving uh, five iPhones, then we have clicked it. iPhone is giving it, then we have clicked it. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, um, Martina, Abba, Parquesi, and Chinezo. Thank all of you for your uh, conversations and stuff. So the question is, is Russia terrorizing Ukraine? All the people who say yes, I want to hear you say yes. All those who say no. no. Okay. So what is Russia doing in Ukraine? They are visiting. <laughs> or they are passing through. Or they are... They are what? No, but me, I have a different belief though. You have a different okay, belief. I, I won't ask you. terrorizing all of us. <laughs> okay. So Russia is terrorizing all, all of, of us. Okay. So we, 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 the question that we are going home with is, can a country terrorize another country? Yes. Can normal human, ordinary people terrorize a whole country? Yes. yes. Can um, groups terrorize other groups? Yes. And the last one is, uh, when people use health control and birth control stuff, to try and prevent a whole um, generation of people from being born. You know, like maybe you are in a country where there are so many tribes and then one tribe, which is dominant with a lot of money, decides to cut off the not so dominant tribe so that they don't give birth to have more of those people uh, coming into the system. Would that amount to terrorism or genocide or... Um, a lot of questions there. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. I, th I think I've enjoyed this session. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you for your conversation. My name is Robert Force Asari. I work with Asasi Radio. You can pass by, visit us. Let's have a conversation. Yeah, so I'm a GIJ, University of Ghana alumni. Thank you very much, guys. When you hear the word robotics, what comes to mind? Hi, I'm Julian, the Department Coordinator for the MISC Department. I'd like to tell you a little bit about robotics engineering and why Academic City is so excited about it. What is robotics engineering? Robotics engineering is an interesting multidisciplinary field of engineering that involves the design, construction, operation and use of robots or robotic systems to assist humans solve a variety of problems. It combines all the conventional engineering disciplines, mechanical, electrical, computer engineering, in this solution drive. Our robots are doing a lot of interesting things for us humans, like teaching young ones how to code, assisting medical practitioners with surgical operations, helping with rescue missions when there are accidents, going into places where humans cannot go, streamlining processes in manufacturing plants, and providing an avenue for STEM education. Now, don't be scared. Robots are not here to take jobs from humans. They are here to assist us make our lives better. Do you know that robotics engineers are some of the happiest tech workers around? They build some of the fanciest systems in the world. I mean, imagine having to build something like this as part of your job and imagine more importantly that you are saving lives through that process. At Academic City, we believe Ghana needs industrialization to move to the next level of progress, and this requires the setup of lots of large-scale manufacturing plants. However, discussing the subject of large-scale manufacturing plants without robotics is like trying to set up or run a company without doing some accounting. So we are preparing our students in advance of this happening in Ghana. We are preparing our students to be future-ready. 
Also, we have a lot of youth in Ghana today who are excited about robots, drones, programming, etc. and would like the opportunity to try their hands at some of these things. But to the best of my knowledge, we don't have any universities offering robotics programs in Ghana. We determined that a full four-year program dedicated solely to robotics would meet this challenge. Due to the multidisciplinary nature of the robotics engineering program, robotics engineers can fit into a wide variety of fields, including mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, computer engineering, research and development, regulatory agencies like the Ghana Standards Authority. You can work in academia. You can also work as an entrepreneur. So, like it or not, robotics is the wave of the future, and Academic City is here to prepare you for it. Hello, my name is Benedict Amwako. I'd say my journey in Academicity has been about self-discovery. During my time here at Academicity, I've been able to build up a lot on myself and be able to find what I'm capable of doing within here. An example of the things that I've been able to do is coming here within the first three weeks of being a student in Academicity. I started the Academicity Robotics Club which has been more about being able to impact students with the skills in robotics, the skills in electronics and programming, and giving them the ability to be able to practically implement them within tools that have been made available. Another thing I learned in Academic City is to be a leader and to take up leadership roles to be able to inspire others. And with that, I became the General Secretary of the first SRC on campus. Two of the major courses I learned in Academic City were around economics and intro to business. In these two courses, I had a very good lecturer who really made me understand the need to be able to market your skills. And the skills that I had at that moment that I knew was viable was the skill of teaching robotics and be able to teach um, the young ones how to be able to get into the field of technology. And as such, with the inspiration that uh, I gained from the course that Academicity had been able to curate in a manner that would inspire others to do more, I was able to start my own company. And that led me to where I am today, having a company running for two years. Ultimately, I believe once you set your mind to a specific task, you should have that passion and drive to be able to achieve it. And you should be able to prioritize, to be able to have all your things in order so that you have success in whatever you do. I am Likem Senaya, a very, very proud parent of Academic City University College. I seize this opportunity to invite potential parents to an upcoming parents' night at the university premises at Hacho, Agoga. On Wednesday, the 10th of August at 6 p.m., it's an opportunity to interact with faculty members and other parents and even the pioneers of the Institute. For me, Academic City is the place to be and is indeed the future for this nation and for the continent. So if mechanical and materials engineering is the godfather of engineering, then industrial and systems is the godmother. My name is Fred mcbagwan -Lurie. I'm the president of Academic City University College. Today I'd like to introduce to you a very interesting topic that is close and dear, not just to me, but to our national development efforts. That is the field of industrial and systems engineering. Often these are the men and women in the shadows that we don't see too much of. I call them the invisible hands in the shadows and the invincible hands in the open. There's no any other field of engineering that brings reality home to us but industrial and systems engineering. In these times of global uncertainty, shortages, hikes and prices, it is these invincible hands that are working assiduously 
to make sure we get access to the things that we need for our day-to-day -day upkeep. But what is this field called industrial and systems engineering? Why is it so critical to our national development efforts? So essentially what industrial and systems engineers do is basically rely on analytic data and the specialized critical skills that they are given to optimize complex processes and systems, whether they are in networks, whether they are in investments, whether they are in governance, whether they are in healthcare, whether they are in manufacturing. It is this body of knowledge that is brought to bear. So we hear these words all the time. You know, productivity enhancement, quality control, uh, productivity index, performance enhancement, streamlining of processes, performance improvement. These are words that are so familiar to this group of people. So let's bring this home. Typically when you walk into a restaurant, the size of the cooking pot actually tells you the number of people that they get there every day. Nobody is going to use a cooking pot that can cook for 10 people and attempt to cook for 100 people because they'll go through a series of iterations. So even in our restaurants today and in our chop bars, people are making industrial related decisions to streamline their process to make sure that their customers are satisfied and to return for more. So if you look at where we are in our development now, where we depend entirely on imports and procurements from abroad, until this field is shaped, we'll continue to have engineering fields that can produce. So your mechanical guys, your electrical guys, your computer engineers can design. But the guys that will take this, the men and women that will take this to realization are the industrial guys that will make a decision. If you want to make an engine, the resources that you will need to build one engine is definitely different from the resources you need to build a thousand engines. That is when you have your industrial and systems at the table. So remember, industrial engineering is an integral part of what we need to do as a nation in order to improve. So Academic City provides young adults with an avenue where they can study industrial and systems engineering. The idea for industrial and system engineering came about because the government had invited us to a retreat to talk about the next stages of employment and industrialization. It is really these skill sets that can best be leveraged to address some of these fundamental issues in our industrial setup. So whether it's in Wologo or it's in Commander Sugar Factory, these are the people that you're going to need there to make sure that your processes are functioning and you are delivering products to your customers on time and with quality. So we welcome you to this beautiful program we have here. We believe that it's in response to national aspirations and the imperatives of industrialization in this country is best rested on it. So join us in our mechanical engineering shop where we have some of the high-end modern equipment for training industrial engineers and you will be on a journey of a lifetime. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dori Kukwesi and I was the first Academic City Student Council President. If I had to describe that experience in one word, I'd either use impactful or full of grief. Initially, we, the SIC really didn't have a place here. We were now forming, so we're now starting it up. So our main concern was where do we stand, where does the voice of students stand, and how to relate with the school. And I'm glad to say we worked on that, we made some progress. I mean, there's still work to be done, but I'm glad with where we ended, and I'm glad that the rest are now taking it up and continuing with our legacy. The reason I went for the position was I felt being the first president was quite important in the sense of forming structures or putting down things that the SRC could continue with. So I didn't really concern myself with the bigger things or the events and stuff. I looked at, or my team actually looked at trying to form our place here in terms of our policies and also putting down principles and policies that would help the future SRC executives run the SRC. Um, the school was actually very supportive in our tenure. Um, some of us, or actually all of us, had people to talk to concerning our work to go to advice for. I personally had people like Ms. Giselle, 
the career coordinator and a few other lectures. Um, I'd say Dr. Fred's lecture class with us, sorry, Leadership One, um, helped to, like the principles we learned from it actually really helped guide me in my tenure. The principles we learned concerning the past leaders of Africa and guys outside there. Just being able to dive into their minds and the experiences that they had really helped give me, um, drive me actually in what I would do. Hi, I'm Larry, a biomedical engineer. In the next few minutes, I will pick your interest in biomedical engineering and why Academic City is the best place to support your training in biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering is an exciting branch of engineering that combines all the conventional engineering disciplines, such as mechatronics, robotics, computer, electronics, and medicine to solve very complex health-related problems. Biomedical engineers are responsible for designing simple health tools such as syringes, catheters, stethoscopes, to very complex health technologies such as magnetic resonance imaging, life support systems, computer tomography, and many more. A typical biomedical engineering curriculum has a strong foundation in life sciences, which is also what every medical student takes in their first three years of training, in addition to engineering. But what is really exciting about the Academic City Biomedical Engineering Program is how the curriculum is structured and offered. At Academic City, emphasis is largely placed on relevant practical training, innovations, and 